It is good that you are here to record this picture of me in my palace garden at Addis Ababa. People who see this throughout the world will realize that even in the 20th century, with faith, courage, and the just cause, David will still beat Goliath. Yes, yes sir. Sir. And that is His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie, the first Lord of Lords, King of Kings, conquering line of the tribe of Judah. And um, he was welcoming foreign journalists to his palace. Um, it's also one of those uh, rare interviews where you find His Majesty speaking in English because he usually would speak in Amharic. He was very yeah. proud of his language yes. and he wanted people to go and find the translation. Yes, you know the funny part, he learned French fluently, but he only used French in diplomatic matters, but never ever would he do a speech in any other language apart from Amharic. Yeah, man, and that is, of course, welcoming you into Stir It Up. Last Wednesday, we did part one of Haile Selassie, and uh, we discussed a little bit of history about him. And today, we will be discussing about some of his, um, you know, achievements in Ethiopia and achievements all around Africa and the world as well. Yes, so, yeah, man, welcome to Stir It Up. Unajoini time your bundles na kupe attention because class is in session. And we are still healing up the most high Emperor Selassie I jar Rastafari. Rastafari. I, yes, I. And most definitely, as we are speaking on Rastafari, the one and only Emperor Haile Selassie I. We have a little clip, man. So if you have your data bundles, you're good. If you have your little Wi-Fi, and you're good. But if you don't know where you Rasta, keep it locked. Just have a good listen because right about now, we're about to take you to school, you know what I mean? Check this and hear this, my people. Keep be, please be attentive. There was a glimpse of a new Ethiopia. And 20 years later, under the Emperor Menelik, grandson of Sahli Selassie and half-uncle to Haile Selassie, that glimpse became something like reality. Europe's scramble for Africa was then in full swing. And as the Western empires planted their flags all over the continent, only Menelik's Ethiopia seemed able to stand against them. At Addis Ababa in Sahli Selassie's old kingdom, Menelik created a new capital for his empire. It was Ethiopia's first permanent capital since the heyday of Gonda, 200 years before. Menelik's palace is still used 80 years later by Haile Selassie, and to him it's a permanent reminder of the day when Ethiopia showed that it could, after all, resist the power of Europe, when Menelik's army in these mountains defeated an Italian invasion at the Battle of Adowa. The year was 1896, and the traditional Ethiopian painting tells the story of a modern awakening. It was the first time a European army had been defeated by Africans since Hannibal beat the Romans 2,000 years ago. Menelik's celebrations were huge and noisy. But the struggle was unfinished. It was another medieval scene. The horsemen were dressed in the monkey skins of war with Ras Michael at their head. On the other side, Rastafari's men gathered for battle in the same way. In Europe, the bloodiest of modern wars was being fought with tanks, machine guns and poison gas. But here, the centuries rolled back as if to King Henry at Agincourt, or Richard losing his crown at Bosworth Field. Like Menelik's victory at Adowa, this battle of Rastafari for his crown has become one of the great subjects of Ethiopia's popular art. The battle lasted a full day, surging one way and then another. But in the end, the man who rode back to Addis Ababa in triumph was Rastafari. 
It was a victory that he still recalls as the turning point of his life. But almost immediately, he was embroiled in the outcome of the other war in Europe. Yes, sir, my people. If you have seen that clip, that clip explains Menelik the first when he fought off the Italians, you know what I mean, when they tried to invade Ethiopia. Yeah. And, you know, Haile Selassie followed in his footsteps. And when he was following in his footsteps, he was just at a 24 years of age as a regent, you know what I mean? He was trying to make sure that Ras Michael, he was trying to get his son back to the throne because yeah. at that moment, he, the throne had been overthrown. And it once the, the, the Ras Michael's son got overthrown, Empress Zadwanu got into, into power and she gave Haile Selassie regent. And the man then went ahead and fought for his people and, and he actually won. Front line, Rasta. Front line. As, don't forget, at 24 years of age. Yeah, man. And that's so important for us to know because remember we were talking about resistance and how the people have the power. Now imagine as a regent you go to stand with your people and mm. fight for your country. Yeah. And that's why Ethiopia was never colonized. It's because the leader himself was a warrior. Was a warrior. He was like, they're not going to come here and take our land, you yeah. know. And um, as a youth man, so you know what, youth, that is a very, very good example from His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie, that if you want change and if you want your country to be a better place, that you have to go to the front line of the battle. Yes, I most definitely. And my people, we don't just stop there. You know, Emperor Selassie, I, it's not a topic we can tread on lightly rasta you know yes, what i mean true. so most definitely i need you to keep your he your ear locked because right about now i'm about to take you again to school real quick and then we're going to be back just to let you know some more information on this in the mouth of ramsay mcdonald britain's prime minister the age of appeasement was born its first sacrifice in the cause of peace in our time was to be the emperor haile selassie in ethiopia the emperor could do no more than play for time against the italian threat winning the loyalty of the tribes and princes by a traditional mixture of prestige and bribery and hoping that his old friends, Britain and France, would still come to his rescue. But Haile Selassie and his men were whistling in the dark. The Italian troops were already embarking and Britain and France would do no more than proclaim an embargo on arms sales to both sides. For Italy, with her own arms, the embargo was a green light. For Ethiopia, it was a death sentence. But for Haile Selassie, the final betrayal came at the League of Nations. Pierre Laval, the French foreign minister, and Sir Samuel Hoare for Britain, proposed to hand part of Ethiopia to Mussolini. Appeasement had triumphed. Collective security was a myth. On the 2nd of May, his family took the train from Addis Ababa to Djibouti. On the 5th of May, Haile Selassie followed them. He left behind the agony of defeat to confront his betrayers at the League of Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, the second speaker on the list is His Majesty the Nicholas Haile Selassie. He did so with a dignity that has become a legend. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le The jeers of fascists in the gallery did not stop him. I am here to claim justice, he said. What reply shall I take back to my people? There was no answer, and there could be none. The League was dead. So, said the Emperor, it is us today. It will be you tomorrow. We on Star It Up today are discussing part two of Emperor Haile Selassie and his achievements in Ethiopia. And um, Riddick, um, yeah. before we went into the music, yeah. was a very, very important clip. Yes, very, very important because you see, 
Back in that time, uh, Britain and France were allies to Emperor Selassie when he joined into the League of Nations. And you know, with the League of Nations, they had these collective security papers signed where they agreed if uh, one party gets attacked, the others would come to aid. But of course, they, they, they dissed the majesty. Yes, sir. They went ahead and did an embargo whereby, you know, Italy produced their own weapons, but Ethiopia never produced their own weapons. So you can imagine, here's a country coming with their own weapons, with the fact factories of weapons, and here's another country. With spears, spears horses, and horses. Rastafari spirits. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. Yeah. And you know what I love about that clip? They were booing him, and they were trying to intimidate him, but yeah. His Majesty truly is a king, because he let them do that. The patience he The patience. Yeah, he was But amazing. I love how he stood up for his people and said, I've come here, mm. and what am I going to go back and tell my people and this is the kind of leaders that we are lacking in yeah. africa today the courage itself just to stand there in front of the people who World betrayed Babylon. you you know yeah, what i mean yes, so most definitely still class is in session rasta so man man i need you to keep it locked you know what i mean we have a short clip again we are going to be playing you right about now so i need you to keep it locked if you are streaming www.vibrator.co.ke if you are locked 104.5 or wherever you are rasta listen to this please Easy escape from the isolation and poverty of Haile Selassie's empire. There was no mineral wealth, no really modern economy of any kind. There weren't even any communications. The Italians had built a few roads, but the war had destroyed them again. And one of the first decisions the emperor had to make was whether he should rebuild the roads through these mountains. He decided he wouldn't, for the time being anyway. Instead, he put his faith in the air. With American help, he created a network of tiny airstrips that broke down the isolation of the interior for the first time. When the 1950s opened, Ethiopian airlines were in business. It was Haile Selassie's first major accomplishment in modernizing his country. There was everything else still to be achieved. Yet at this moment, by a stroke of luck, Ethiopia's past for the first time came to the aid of the present and made Haile Selassie and his capital the focus of Africa's new hopes. As almost the only independent African ruler after the war, Haile Selassie provided a symbol of self-respect for black men just emerging from white rule. The wind of change had come to Africa. Recognizing the emperor's unique position, the United Nations chose Addis Ababa as its African headquarters, and he embarked on a new political career. The age in which we live, your imperial majesty, is an age of paradox. In his brand new Africa Hall, Haile Selassie presided at innumerable meetings of his new revolutionary colleagues. He became the great African father figure, the great African peacemaker, in the Congo, in Biafra, in Morocco and Algeria. It was a strange apotheosis for the King of Kings. He didn't always succeed, but his voice commanded respect, because he alone in Africa had been both victim and victor in the struggle against colonial rule. He alone had been the first martyr of the old League of Nations and was now a founder and guide of the new United Nations. Seeing his influence in the new Africa, the world beat a path to his door. The Organization of African Unity followed the United Nations and set up shop in Addis Ababa. Diplomats and businessmen flocked in. Within a decade, the face of Addis Ababa was transformed. The signs of international affluence towered over the old open drains.
Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And, you know, you can find out just from listening how many things um, Emperor Haile Selassie yes, did I. and what a man he was because, you know, as they said, he was both victim and victor uh, and just the only African leader who was willing to stand up in that time, you know, um, as well as, you know, still discussing some of the achievements, you know, Emperor Haile Selassie was very, very focused on modernizing his country. Yeah. And as we heard in the clip, he started with, um, you know, roads, the train. Yeah. And and the all that. Riddick, system. you're going to tell us about the transport system. Yeah. But also, you know, uh, as we also heard, the United Nations and then later yeah. um, the African Union, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I'm so honored that I was able to go to both the UN headquarters and mm. um, African Union headquarters, African Union headquarters in, yeah. in Ethiopia as well. It's something that you just feel the greatness. You feel His Majesty's spirit there, yeah. you know. And I think it's a good example to all of us of how one man can make such a big difference. Yeah, for me, I think it was very exciting how he did you see most people would have thought of doing the roads first and you know that would have taken a long time to be honest yeah the man them just went straight to the air <laughs> did fill strips all over ethiopia where you can be able you know he connected ethiopia from the country to addis ababa yeah and don't forget about the transport system when he he, did, he made the coastline train the france france made the coastline train station we have connected addis ababa all the way to uh, benin actually so this is very amazing because this uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, you see, he do, he's doing this, all these achievements in a very short while, to be honest. Yeah, man. And, you know, and that was a time that, you know, it wasn't so easy to do this. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about it now, yeah. oh, he started, you know, Ethiopian Airlines, whatever. It sounds like a small thing. Yes. But when you go back into history and look at the other countries and stuff, they were not doing anything like that at yet. All. Look at no us. No state in Africa was doing what he was doing. Actually. Look at us right now. We only just got a train connecting us to Mombasa just yeah the other day yeah and we still really trying to figure out our transport yeah but when you go to Addis Ababa and you check the highways and you check the roads and it's you can just tell that it's inspired by his majesty works to be a better and bigger African country yeah and don't forget the Mandem was a peacemaker like a great peacemaker from Morocco all the way down to Sudan like the he, his word was very very it never fell on dead ears I can say because every time the Mandem talk action had to be taken you know what I mean yes I and you know we still meditate in Rasta, reasoning on the one and only Emperor, Emperor Haile Selassie, the first. Yeah, man. Yeah, I know. And let me tell you, for me, um, I think one of the biggest achievements uh, Emperor Haile Selassie did was taming I and I. <laughs> <laughs> Very big achievement. Yeah, because let me tell you, everybody tried to tame my spirit and nobody could. But when I discovered about His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie, I think I found a new vision for my life and mm. a kind of direction as a youth, you yeah. know? And um, that's why I also named my son Tafari, because I really want him to be a great African Man, yeah. you know, somebody who stands up for what he believes for in. something, yeah. And you know, I really don't know, like, where African countries are leading with these kind of uh, leaders we have. Um, in the time when, you know, we had Nelson Mandela as well, and we had Kwame Nkrumah, we yeah. had Haile Selassie. We've had so many great African leaders in the past. Yeah. But I can't even name a few right now, like... <laughs> um, Maybe Kofi Annan, right? Yeah. Because he was a peace, you know, a, a peace ambassador, you know. And also because he had to come and uh, get two grown people in our country to talk. So I really big up him <laughs> yes, for sir. that, you know. Yeah. Um, but what do you think um, for you are some of the biggest achievements uh, Emperor Haile Selassie did? For me, I think the biggest achievements was bringing his country together because, you know, under Emperor Haile Selassie, Eritrea was still under Ethiopia and even though they were trying to get their uh, their own independence once that happened you can you can see they broke out a lot of war until until recently until recently yeah. yeah where they went ahead and got peace so most definitely that was a big big thing for me because Emperor Selassie was a very big diplomat he knew how to sit down the chiefs and let them know this is the word and this is how we're gonna go mo and move forward because the Mandem was the last word even whilst he still had a, a prime minister the prime minister always had to go ahead and consult the emperor himself on hard issues and yes i on top of that here we still have you know we're still having running the class you know what i mean and most definitely here's another little clip i need you to pay attention to it please so if you are streaming www.vibesradio.co.ke and if you are locked on vibes radio on the airwaves please have a very big and good listen Thank you. 
With the bankers and diplomats came foreign money and foreign aid. There were new ports, new roads, new dams to be opened. America trained the emperor's army. Russia built his schools. Israel provided technicians. India supplied teachers. Britain brought doctors. France offered culture. Germany sent trade missions. Haile Selassie's old empire had become the new African showcase, and everyone wanted an exhibit there. Today, Haile Selassie is besieged by foreign delegations hoping to catch his ear. He balances these contemporary forces to strengthen his own independence as shrewdly as he juggled half a century ago with the rival tribes and princes in his old fight for power. One day it may be a Japanese delegation, the next day a mission from Maoist China. It doesn't matter what political persuasion they are, they all see Haile Selassie as an essential link to the rest of Africa. At home or abroad, half his life seems consumed with ceremonial state visits. Some of them purely political, some of them simply a tribute to his personal stature. Even with Italy, he's made friends again. On a state visit to Rome, 30 years after Mussolini's troops had been driven from his country. At home, he seems all-powerful, adding to the natural mystery of a divine monarchy, the artificial cult of personality. His name is everywhere. His presence seems all-pervading. His word seems law. His ministers are overshadowed by him, and his government is run by him. His palace is surrounded by all the machinery of a modern administration. But even his prime minister brings the important decisions back to him. In his old age, it looks as if Haile Selassie has routed all his enemies at last, to emerge supreme as if the all-wise and benevolent lion of Judah has prevailed. Yeah, man, Emperor Haile Selassie, I, King of Kings, Lion of Judah, you yeah, know man. what I mean? Yeah, conquering lion, yes, first sir. of all. Yeah, man, and you know, um, it's important as a leader for other people to take you seriously. Very. And that's what I like about His Majesty as well. Yeah. But, you know, another thing is that... Um, Next week on part three, we are going to be talking about one of the biggest achievements, which he really, you know, didn't have such a big part in. Yeah. But the Rastafari had a big part in. Yes. And we're going to have a Rasta man come in and talk to us about the link of Haile Selassie and Rastafari. Yeah, man. And, you know, that is a very important thing. When you talk about Haile Selassie, lazima utataja Rasta. Yes, I must Because definitely. already Rastafari comes from his name. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be discussing that on part three of um, Haile Selassie yes, um, next week on Wednesday. Yeah, man. So, you guys, it's still a part three coming because this was a really great man, you know? Yeah. And uh, we need to big him up all the time because they do not teach us this in a school, man. Yeah, and you know, the funny part is, as I saw that video, you know, one thing that took to my eye keenly was that you can see he had a hand in everything that was happening in Ethiopia. It didn't matter if he had a permanent secretary in that segment. It didn't matter if he had whatever. The man that made sure Kila Sector Akona say. Nearly half the population of Ethiopia now is under the age of 15. And for Haile Selassie, their education has always been an obsession. He's taken personal charge of the Ministry of Education, sought teachers and money for more schools from half the countries in the world, and turned one of his palaces into a university. He's directly responsible for whatever schooling these youngsters get. But like everywhere else, the more they have, the more they want. School strikes and revolutionary slogans take command. And Haile Selassie's efforts are dismissed by the young as mere failure and repression. Haile Selassie is a lonely man now. His wife, two sons, a daughter are all dead. And though others remain to keep him company now and then, the essential solitude of his life on the tightrope of power must grow more oppressive every year. On one side, there's still the old Ethiopian world of feudal power and tradition. On the other, there's the new challenge of his own reforms, 
the educated youngsters and the modern army officers who want the world and would like it now. They're the upper and nether millstones which have ground many a good man exceeding small, especially in this century. To have survived them for the better part of 55 years in power is something unequaled by any ruler in the world today. No wonder the Lion of Judah has become one of the living legends of our time. 